Hello, I want to share with you a very inspiring yet simple story from rural India. This is the state of Chhattisgarh. Chhattisgarh has about 16% of India's coal deposits and produces 12,400 megawatts of coal power on a daily basis. It produces enough coal power that it sells the extra and surplus to the neighboring states. Yet, despite being endowed with adequate natural resources, the state has one of the lowest per capita in the country. At about Rs. 99,000 or roughly 1300 US dollars, the state can be categorized as one of the poorest states in the country. About one third of its public health centers don't have access to quality power or even uninterrupted power. Yet, something has been happening in the state since 2013. This image that you see is from the public health center in the village Haldibadi, one of the several public health centers in the state. This second image is from another health center in the village called Umarwahi. Interestingly, the only difference between the first and the second is that the second one has a rooftop solar system installed. Chhattisgarh Renewable Energy Development Agency, or CREDA as it is called, has put about 900 such solar systems across the health centers in the state. These are small systems with a capacity of about 3.3 kilowatt and uh, all of them have a battery backup system. Why would you think it's so interesting that we are talking about it right now? Well, health centers which have the solar system uh, get 50% more patients visiting and the footfall is more. The doctors are able to take care of their patients better because they have water supply and electricity supply both. The doctors are able to manage the potency of their drugs and vaccines and be able to store them because they can put a simple refrigerator or a cold storage. It makes sense even because the deliveries and surgeries which were first happening in other hospitals are now happening here. There is evidence that neonatal care has improved twice and 50% more deliveries are happening in such public health centers which have solar systems installed. All of this by having a block of silicon on the roof. All of this throws a lot of light on how every action in the world today needs to happen in a way that it does not exacerbate climate change. We are not just in the midst of climate change. We are in a climate emergency. All of us have seen in our lifetimes, and indeed all of us have seen at least in the last decade or so, the extreme weather events have escalated to such a degree that it's no longer a question of when the next floods will happen, but really how much we can do to contain them. We have seen in the last couple of years the frequency and intensity of many of the events like rains, droughts, floods, storms, etc have continued to increase. And it's not just in India. Even take the example of this year. As the COVID pandemic has assailed the world, we have seen large parts of the world also being at the same time and in parallel being impacted by climate change. A lot of people in the world have lived this year through compound crisis. Look at what happened in Australia and in the west coast of US with the wildfires. In case you missed those images, this first image is from the city of San Francisco with the beautiful Golden Gate Bridge in the front. This is how the city looks normally. And this is how it looked on the morning of 9th of September when fires were blazing across most of California. This is how Australia would normally look. And this is how the suburb was looking when Australian wildfires were burning. I don't have images here from India, but all of us have lived experiences of incessant rains, of droughts, of floods, of things like locust swarms. Those of us in the Northeast this year saw the oil wells burning for a large number of weeks and could not be contained. There are many examples of farmers across the country and their produce being destroyed by poor rains uh, and, and drought conditions. And it's quite clear and evident that India as well is being impacted by climate change. It's not a global phenomena. It's quite in my backyard. It's only a question on how much we are able to have the long lens and the near vision to be able to see it. The science behind all this is really simple. And the science behind all this has been understood for decades now. 
The more carbon we pump into the atmosphere, the stronger is the greenhouse emissions and more is the warming. So what is it that we can do? Do we ban all cars? Do we just shut our appliances? Do we stop going out? Do we stop leading a normal life? Do we just let the economies grow at the scale that they would, they would grow in a very poor fashion? Fortunately, we don't have to do that. There are some solutions out there. And as a matter of fact, the good news is that some of the solutions are quite perfect. When we look at renewable energy, which is energy that is based in sources that are not only clean, but also renewable and regenerative, for example, the sun and the wind, power systems which are now based on such renewable sources are pretty mature technology. They can ramp up and down to suit any demand, which is very unlike a coal power plant, which once started will take thousands and lakhs of rupees to start back again. Renewables are becoming a mature technology. Renewables are becoming cost competitive for several reasons of economic, environmental and social. Renewables are the preferred choice for a lot of companies, industries, governments, states, cities and countries across the world. The latest International Energy Outlook report, an authoritative body on energy policy of the world, which was incidentally released just a couple of days ago, clearly for the first time points out that solar electricity is the cheapest ever in history. And that is quite remarkable. Let's talk for a second about the other fossil fuels, for instance, oil. If you look at oil demand in the world, the world energy outlook by the petroleum company BP, this time very clearly states that the world has reached an oil demand peak, which means that due to the COVID pandemic, the demand for oil reduced and the forecast is that that demand is never going to fully recover. There are signs on how this thing can really be true. If you remember late in April, there were these stark images from across the world showing how oil tankers have been offshore simply because nobody in US was willing to buy oil and there was no way for these oil tankers to go and offload oil. Oil demand is not going to come up the way it did in the last couple of years and the world has indeed seen peak oil. There are a few other examples quite related and here and there. We've all seen during the lockdowns that as employers were first obligated to let employees to work from home and now more and more are taking that as a preferred choice, even the energy consumption in the buildings is not coming back to the regular level. And that means that city planners, urban decision makers, governments and urban local bodies are also now thinking more and more about things like uh, extending walking paths, extending pedestrian pathways, uh, making sure that cities have uh, lanes for cycling and also making sure that mass public transit is both reliable as well as affordable and adequate. All of this actually bodes quite well in many ways. It brings a lot of benefits to air quality. And as an Indian and as a Delhiite, it's hard for me to let go of that benefit that comes from breathing clean air. Most of us in large parts of our country have struggled for decades to know what clean air is like. As a result of the COVID pandemic, the, the, the lockdown which was enforced, unfortunately, was the first time many of us saw what breathing clean air is about. And this provides a long lens to what is possible if we are able to contain our emissions, very simply put. It also means that travel itself can be carbon free, it can be hassle free and it can be more affordable. It is a world where it is already 50% cheaper to own and drive an electric car as it is to drive a traditional internal combustion engine. It is a world in which battery technology has advanced enough that 100 or 150 kilometers on a single charge can be, can be run uh, by an electric vehicle and that's pretty much not more than the commute that most of us make on a daily basis. We are living in a changed world, but which also realizes that more and more needs to be done on climate action. It's not just at the level of uh, governments and cities and states. There are a lot of companies, corporations and big industries who are also seeing the writing on the wall. Take, for example, the National Thermal Power Corporation, India's largest coal producer. NTPC decided a couple of years ago that it will not invest any longer in coal. It will continue to have the coal that, is ha that it has, which will linger on for a while, but all its new investments will come in renewable energy henceforth. That's a big change. There are lots of global investors and companies which are seeing the value of renewable energy, putting more money there, 
and who realize that coal is no longer king. Such kind of headlines are pretty common in global media now. Take the case, for example, of Indian Railways, one of the largest employers in the country and something that touches the lives of most Indians is now installing about 20,000 megawatt solar power capacity by 2030. That in and of itself is going to be game changing and not just symbolic. And of course, it will supply a lot of cheap and reliable power to the Indian Railways when it needs the most. We've discussed a lot about you know, the role of the governments and what the governments and policymakers should do, how climate action is important and urgent. But in all of this conversation, I want to spend the last couple of minutes really about the power of change that can also happen by individuals, communities and corporations acting. Climate change is such a big issue that it will take all the wheels to turn to be able to turn the dial on climate action. We cannot have one entity not acting. And to make sure that everybody needs to act, we also need to make sure that everybody understands what needs to be done at their own level. Let's also take the case of Tata Power. It's one of India's largest private coal producers. When Tata Power decides and make a commitment to not invest further in coal, but to make sure that the expansion of its power only comes from renewables, I think that's also big news and must be considered as a way on what corporations are really seeing as what makes not just business sense, but also economic um, sense and ecological and environmental sense. There is more that can happen even at the level of small organizations. For example, you know, I spoke about the lockdown earlier. Even during the lockdown, large companies encouraged work from home. But to be honest, even smaller companies, if they encourage work from home uh, for their employees, that's a way to retain productivity at the same time, cut overheads and extra costs that, that will come by bringing all the employees to office seven days a week. That's not needed anymore. COVID indeed has changed the paradigm and the thinking of people. And it feels like the time is right, both to be able to stress the human intransigence of nature, but also the fact that it's human beings again who will have to come and galvanize themselves together, either in the form of communities or corporations or companies or, or policy makers or political action to be able to go where we need to go on climate action. There are a few things, certainly at the level of an individual, which we must be aware of, and given a chance, we can try and see if that's possible to do. Look at this image. This is from the city of Hyderabad. It could also be from some other city like Ahmedabad or Jaipur, for example. All this shows is that if we were to paint the rooftops of our houses with white paint, it will reflect 60 to 80 percent of energy back into the system, making sure that the insides of the house are two to five degrees cooler. This simple activity assumes a lot of significance, especially for a country like India, where we know in the next 10 years or so, a lot more people will migrate to the cities. Urbanization will be the rising trend. And as we have people living in crowded places in the cities, thermal comfort is going to be a big part of how and where India is going to consume energy. And clearly, our government is also cognizant of this fact, and which is why they have launched the National Cooling Pro Program, which has some pointers on how to make sure that thermal comfort is provided and restored, but at the same time, it does not lead to greater energy use. I think that's a good thing. Look at a few simple things. We see some of the people when they are making their houses instead of concrete, they are using materials like clay and earth in the walls. And that really brings down the temperature of the building and the house itself. These are simple measures, but I think we can adopt them in our own way wherever possible to not just make that simple contribution and feel good, but also to be able to show that a better India is possible. The truth really is that we cannot postpone climate action it's clear to us that climate change is here and now. It's happening in front of us. And to that extent, the actions and measures that need to be taken to make sure that we don't worsen climate change are also taken now. There are several intersections that need to be drawn. And it's not just about the politicians and the policy makers to act. It's for each one of us to realize at our own levels things we can do. 
even if we can check how we are producing and consuming our energy, if possible, if we can shift to EVs, if possible, if we can shift to public transit, if possible, we walk and cycle, if possible, we install a solar rooftop system. There is a lot more that we can aggregate and cumulatively show the power of individual action and the power that communities across the country can bring about change with. Thank you.